back. It's the four o'clock rock. It's Think Tech Tech Talks, okay? With Sean Moss, who's executive director of Oceanic Institute at HBU. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jake. Nice, nice to, to be back. Nice yeah, be it's been back. a while. It's been two years. Two right? years. That's right. to catch up with you. That's right. So this is uh, something fishy in Waimanalo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, as it should be, because we want fishy. <laughs> we do. We do. The fishier, the better. <laughs> really, and we're talking about that today. I'm really, I'm totally curious about this. You know, springing off our last conversation, sort of catching up on a world that needs fish. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, Oceanic Institute um, was uh, kind of acquired by HPU several years ago, and then now recently you merged. What, what happened? That's right. So, in 2003 to 2013, we had a, a contract of affiliation between the two organizations. We we retained our autonomous legal entities, but um, we 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 collaborated on, on a number of levels. Some of the marine science faculty at Hawaii Pacific University uh, established a presence at OI and conducted research and have offices there. We had graduate students and undergraduate interns work at OI. And so this happened over the course of about 10 years. Uh, and then as, as the contract of affiliation started to sunset, uh, the two boards decided we either need to get a lot closer together or a lot farther apart. And so um, I'm very pleased to report now, two years after the fact, that the boards decided, in fact, to get a lot closer together. We merged, and Oceanic Institute is now the first directed research unit at HPU. That's great. Yeah. So you have all this um, collaborative synergy going right. on between the school, I, I bet the students must love it. They do. The faculty, you know, in other areas, administrators must love it because it's research. It, it puts right. you at a certain level. Of re it's global because we have this great environment here for that. A absolutely, I think, I think as the university projects forward, there's some interest in, in enhancing the graduate student experience there. And I know as a gradu former graduate student that hands-on uh, research assets and opportunities have tremendous value. So I'd like to think that Oceanic Institute brings those opportunities to the graduate student experience, as well as undergraduates. We have a number of undergraduate interns who volunteer, who actually get hands-on experience culturing fish and great. shrimp. This and is great. Yeah, no, it's really a good, a good synergy. Good, good synergy, then, yeah, I was going to say. Um, and so now also, you know, what, a, a year ago, uh, looked like uh, Jeffrey Bannister, that's Jeffrey with a G, if you don't mind. Yes, it is. Was, uh, was going to leave and in the process of leaving or has left. And now you have a new HPU president. Tell us a little about that. Well, I, the, Dr. Bannister will, will, will be HPU's president through the end of our fiscal year, which ends June 30th. And a gentleman named John Gotanda, who is the current uh, dean of law school at Villanova University, will be our, our new president. And I think there'll be uh, some, some overlap. Um, but Dr. Bannister will be uh, driving the bus for, for the next uh, few months. That's great. Yeah. That's great. And, and that you have continuity is really important. Continuity is critically important, right. And it's not an interim like they have at UH all day. Everybody's an interim. No, this is, this, this, is this is the real deal. <laughs> this is the real deal. And uh, John Gotanda has uh, has local ties, and uh, so we're we're anxious to uh, to get him on board and and, and take uh, HPU f in, in, further further into the future. Okay, let's talk about taking Oceanic Institute Sounds into good. the future. Uh, you you do you do projects overseas now. We do. So give us give us a you know a, a sort of an uh, update on uh, your expansion and your um, research since say two years ago. Sure, we can do that. Um, the the overseas project are largely um, focused on shrimp shrimp aquaculture research. So at OI we have uh, three technical programs. We have a fin fish program that deals obviously with fish, uh, both in the context of aquatic food production, aquatic protein, so for human consumption. And our fin fish program also uh, produces marine ornamental fish for the aquarium trade. And we recently were the world's first entity to close the life cycle on uh, Yellow tang. Are you familiar with the yellow tang? So it's a marine black ornamental and fish. Yellow marks. It's it's pure yellow. It's ah. as an adult. It's one of the um, one of the favorite marine ornamental fishes. I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so the fin fish program deals with fish for food and for the marine or ornamental trade. We have an aquatic feeds and nutrition program that deals with uh, producing aquatic feed for all of the animals for that are aquacultured. For for aquaculture fish. Exactly. This for fish and shrimp. Important. 
very abalone, important. Very important. opihi. Yeah. We've worked with the sea urchins. We've worked with a variety of uh, diets for a variety of species. And then the third program. You need to get the best possible composition that's to right. have them grow faster, exactly. be stronger, all that. Exactly. And the other critical component about the feeds piece is that um, it's becoming imperative to source the ingredients for aquatic feeds from sustainable sources. Historically, the feeds have relied heavily on the use of fish meal, uh, largely Peruvian anchovies and, and, and menhaden and, and uh, um, other, other fishes. Um, but there's a, there's a pushback um, uh, from, from um, people concerned about sustainability, about whether uh, getting uh, most of your protein in the aquatic feeds realm from the capture fisheries, is that a sustainable model? So we've spent a number of years researching vegetable protein analogs, so soy products, and putting soy protein rather than fish meal protein into the feeds and to make it... that works just as well or better? It, it, it can work as well um, under some circumstances. How do, you, how do you provide the protein, though? It, it's 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 largely in the in the in the when you source the ingredients it says mm -hmm. it's a it's a constituent of the ingredient we use and then so we formulate feeds based on protein uh, lipids carbohydrate ratios and the feed formulator will package these up into a into a pelleted feed and we have a feed mill uh, at OI right now a small one and we're building a larger one in Hilo uh, to not only do aquatic animals but also terrestrial animals really which will be uh, a very exciting pr yeah, project so. for us and you're doing this yourself i mean OI is doing this right right so this, this is, is but this is something where you could sell we're research oriented so we won't commercialize the products what we'll do is we'll prov we'll identify in the context of the feed for example will identify locally sourced ingredients. The kind of the co broader context for the feed mill is, is this issue of, the, of, of Hawaii residents having to import 80 to 90 percent of the food we eat. Um, I've heard anywhere from 82 to 95 percent, depending on whether it's an election year or not, right? So, so we, but our, the, the, the issue is we import a lot of feed. Uh, that adds tremendous cost. It adds to the Shipping carbon footprint. Else, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of bad reasons. Uh, to depend on that. But, um, so the feed mill is designed as a research feed mill to source locally available ingredients, whether they come from the agriculture sector, the biofuels, waste streams, slaughterhouse, fish processing plants, and to use these products and waste streams and co-products as value added for feeds for not only the fish and shrimp we want to grow in Hawaii, but the chickens, pigs, and cows as well. And um, this is huge because it, it allows for local agriculture. Exactly. You need this for local. I mean, it's really um, arcane to, to try to have local agriculture and ship the feed in from outside. It's, it's not like, sustainable. It, it's not, and it's yeah. expensive. And, 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 and it's silly, too. Well, we, 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 it's silly. <laughs> we, we talk about what, what happens if. If, we, if our ports get uh, struck by a tsunami and we can't bring in foods uh, into Hawaii, we, we have, again, I've heard different, different quotes on this, anywhere from an 8 to 10 to 12 day food supply here, after which time we're, we're, we're running low on food. And I tell people we start looking at our house cats a little differently, right? <laughs> so that we get concerned. You heard it here on Think Tank. There we go. The reality <laughs> comes blasting through. There we go. So. <laughs> So it, it's becoming, I think, increasingly more important, not only here in Hawaii, but for other U.S.-affiliated Pacific Islands and islands of, of, of any, really any island nation, to establish the capacity to be more self-sufficient in foods. And the, one of the ways we do that here is, is we, we have a, a diversified agriculture industry, and we do some biofuels production that produce waste streams and we have some slaughterhouses and some fish processing plants and we collect all of these things and we evaluate the efficacy of these potential uh, feed ingredient supply chains as feed for all of the kind of so animals you, and you have the ability here. as research, researchers to determine exactly what is in that particular source absolutely right down to the molecular Ex well we'll analyze it for fatty acid profiles amino acid profiles ash content all of the things so we we characterize these potential feed ingredients and they not only vary across ingredients, but within an ingredient over time, different seasons, the biochemical composition of, of, of a breadfruit or a, a papaya or a kukui nut will change. So, um, 
So we do the biochemical analysis, characterize it from a biochemical perspective, and then a, a, a feed nutritionist, a OI's feed nutritionist, will then um, pull from different ingredients based on their nutrient profiles to create a recipe. A recipe, exactly. Yeah. And then the value of the feed mill. Uh, in, that we're building in Hilo is it can produce commercial quantities of feed, not just a few pounds for an aquarium trial. But we can, we'll be able, once this thing is up and running, we'll be able to produce over 450 tons of aquatic feed per year and over 900 tons of terrestrial feed per year. So we can, we can start to ask questions at a meaningful scale. Does ingredient X, Y, and Z, when formulated in these ratios, produce a feed that that elicits uh, the kind of response we want out of this target animal that we're interested in growing in Hawaii. We think this could catalyze the meat producing, or help catalyze the meat producing industry here. We have tremendous support too, I might add. Fed federal government, the state government's been wonderful providing support. Uh, Ulupono Initiative, of course, has uh, a number of do donors have contributed to the construction of the feed mill. Um, so there's tremendous uh, government and, and private sector support for the feed mill. Well, that's good to hear because, yeah. I mean, you can't have a local agricultural industry, not really, uh, or, uh, you know, food production industry without having local feed. So you're Absolutely. an essential element to that. But, uh, you know, what, what does come to mind for me, Sean, is um, uh, when you have 450 tons or more, you know, and you can sort of satisfy all the needs of the existing agricultural industry in the state, um, will they be able to keep up with you? Uh, you know, because they're impeded for one reason or another. The farmers are impeded. Uh, the people who are doing aquaculture sure. are definitely impeded. Uh, it sounds like you're going to be ahead of them for a time. Well, the, this, this research feed mill, what our aspiration is, is that we do a significant proof of concept at scale where a com commercial feed mill will come in and we would continue to serve in this research capacity, but a commercial feed will come in. The and very same feed mill? No, a they, a we, they, feed it would be a different Yours feed mill. Yours is the model, the example. Ours is the model. Um, and, and, um, but you're, you're absolutely correct, at, at, at least in the context of aquaculture, there, there are a lot of barriers to entry into the industry. Um, but we think one of the most critical barriers to, to entry into the industry is the cost to import the feed. If we can overcome that barrier, aquaculture in concert with better policy, um, establishing markets, all of these become critically important. You know, it's, it, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to price point. Can, can the farmer produce a product at a reasonable cost um, and sell it to a, a, a willing market? But we think one of the large, at least technical barriers to enter, entry into the industry of aquaculture is the high cost to import feed. It adds about 50% of the cost, mm, additional 50%, and feed is the number one operating cost in an operation. So it just exacerbates a bad situation. And, and one other thing about that is, is local feed, made here, made locally, made now, um, fresher, more advantageous than feed that's shipped from somewhere else? There's really no local feed available. That's, that's the problem. So I, I would say unequivocally, yes, our goal is to produce a better quality feed at a lower cost. I think that would be the, again, the aspirational goal. Um, we do the research and the legwork. A commercial feed company says, hey, look, this looks like a viable business. We've got a growing meat producing sector in Hawaii. We're going to come and invest and we're going to be able to produce a better quality feed at a lower cost using um, to, to the largest extent possible locally sourced ingredients. Now, there may be some ingredients that need to be shipped in, but the goal is to m minimize that, that amount. Great. Yeah. We have our goals too, and one of our goals is to have a low cost break. Absolutely. So one minute break. I'm won't, ready. You won't even feel it. I'm ready. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Sean Moss of Oceanic Institute. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. 
Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu, and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Bingo, we're back. We're live. We're here with Sean Moss of Oceanic Institute, kind of catching up on what it's been doing the last couple of years, which is a lot. So uh, we have a slide on uh, aquatic, aquatic feed. And if we can see that, Sean can uh, explain a little further about, there it is. Okay, yeah, so this, this slide highlights some of the, the issues I was talking about, the imperative to source locally produced ingredients, whether they're grown specifically for the feed or byproducts or waste streams from other uh, industries. And on the slide you see fisheries waste. So this is fish from a processing plant that typically is discarded into very scarce space in landfill. And um, we've done a lot of research on using fisheries waste and biofuel coal products and waste sugars from say the papaya industry as value added feed ingredients for a whole suite of different aquatic animals including as you see here you see tilapia and moi on the top shrimp in the middle and an opihi on the bottom and we've we've um, formulated diets for all of these aquatic species there's an interesting um, research story behind the waste sugars with papaya about 40% of the papaya produced in Hawaii don't go to market because they're bruised or damaged and they're unmarketable. And we've done some research and some folks at UH have done some research growing fungal protein off the waste sugars from the papaya that would otherwise be discarded. And so we're converting waste papaya into high quality fungal protein that we then incorporate into the diets of fish and shrimp. So this is the type of recycling that, that we're looking forward to. Um, for some of the biofuels, so they, some of these companies grow algae and they press the algae and they get the, this, this, this lipid oil yeah. that's good for biofuel. It's entirely edible too. I don't know about, maybe. Well, I'm going to ask you about I'm that. I'm not sure I'm going to eat it, but, uh, <laughs> but it's good for biofuels, yeah. for biodiesel. Yeah. And, uh, but, but after you press the oils out, um, you get a, a, a protein cake that has a lot of value as a feed additive. Um, so uh, th these are exciting opportunities to... I was going to ask you two questions. Yeah. One is, uh, can, I, can I eat this? Would it be all right if I ate this? Which one? The, the feed you make out of these you, various You could absolutely eat it, yep. But yep. You, you would be a little reluctant? Uh, just a little pinch between my cheek and gum is probably all I'd do. I'm not yeah. sure I'd uh, <laughs> ingest it entirely. The other thing, is there any, any uh, GMO issue here? No, there's no GMO issue. Well, I, some of the ingredient streams may be GMO. The papaya, the papaya, obviously, we eat, we eat a rainbow papaya here. Um, so th that, but but we're growing fungus off of the off of the papaya. So there's no transmittal it's not, of, of it's not GMO. Not actually the papaya. No, yeah, in, yeah. in GMO is it, I, I know it's a it's a particularly sensitive issue, but I, I should point out that the Food and Drug Administration recently approved the sale in the United States of GMO salmon through a comp company called Aqua Bounty. I don't know if you're familiar with that. So this is the first GMO animal on the market for direct human consumption. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we've been eating a lot of GMO foods and all this hubbub about GMO is that it's not sustainable because the world has to eat. The world has to, you can it quote does. me, you can quote me on this. <laughs> okay, send, send letters to Jay Fidel. No, I, I, I think we have to recognize uh, that uh, there's going to, there, there's going to be an increasingly sh uh, global shortfall in food. We've got uh, an increasing population. I forgot what the numbers are now, 9.5 billion by 2050 or something like that. We have increasing uh, spending power of the middle class in places like China and India, where certainly in China there's an insatiable appetite for seafood. So we have to look for technology to help us bridge the chasm between supply and demand. Capture fisheries won't be able to bridge this huge 
huge chasm in seafood demand versus supply. That chasm can only be filled by aquaculture, right. and that's where we see OI as having a fundamental role in food security, food sustainability into the future. You're in exactly the right place in life, no kidding. I mean, you're, you're a historical organization, and you're an historical person. <laughs> Sorry I said that. I'm not sure how to interpret that, but I'll go with it. So what about uh, the international? You've right. become more international. You're into India, China, the Palau, Saipan, where else? Right. Well, uh, th Thailand as well. We, we recently uh, established a relationship with Thailand. So the... The, we, we have uh, the project in India uh, and, and Thailand deal with shrimp breeding projects. So um, a number of years ago, um, in 1995, and I started working at OI in 1986, so I've been around OI Whoa. for a while. Yeah. In 1995, um, we were receiving federal funds that supported what, what's, what was called the U.S. Marine Shrimp Farming Program. And it was through this, this program, it was really a public-private partnership, that we at OI um, borrowed... Uh, breeding procedures, techniques, and protocols from the poultry industry, largely poultry and swine industry. They've been selectively breeding those animals for a long time. And we took pages out of their playbook and we applied them to shrimp. And In so doing, you invented best practices for shrimp broodstock. E exactly, exactly. So we were, it's interesting, uh, genetics wor works at the cellular level, uh, subcellular level. It doesn't matter what those cells are packaged in, whether it's feathers or scales or skin, it operates on the same principles. So uh, we were very pleasantly surprised, or not so surprised, that these breeding protocols and strategies and procedures resulted in incredible um, uh, genetic responses to the selection and we were able to take these aren't GMO now so I don't want to upset the apple cart here. Just, breeding, it, yeah. you, I love when you speak French that's <laughs> wonderful um, yeah exactly genetic principles that uh, irrespective of species um, um, cr creates um, with each generation enhanced traits that you're selecting for uh, now, in any breeding program, it's always a balance between trying to capture those gene combinations that manifest in faster growth or higher survival and not accumulating inbreeding. I, I don't know, we many of us have seen the old movie Deliverance with... Uh, sure. Uh, so we, we know some of the human manifestations of inbreeding. <laughs> yeah, I and remember so, that. <laughs> so th that too transcends species, right? So, um, so even shrimp will 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 manifest inbreeding uh, the, the the impacts of inbreeding through reduced fitness traits so selective breeding is always this balance between trying to improve the economically important traits that you're selecting for and balance that against the accumulation of inbreeding so it's it's always this balance in a breeding program so you invented and I'm I'm going by recollection you invented a, a shrimp broodstock about that big it's a shrimp about that big well, the, 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 the really the, remarkable shrimp. Yeah, the, 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 the mom and pop shrimp called broodstock can get quite big for the species we're working with. And what OI, I, th I think, is known for globally is, is not only it was the first real organization to use what we call family-based breeding to make these incredible performance enhancements over generations, but also we developed... Um, what's analogous to a disease-free shrimp. So the animal that we hold, we know is free of specific pathogens because we test for them routinely using modern molecular tools, um, um, microsatellite markers. And so... There's a slide there. Okay, so this slide, yeah, this, this just basically talks about the foundation of our, of our breeding program. We, we, we founded the breeding program on 10 founder populations from Central and South America and Mexico. Um, and and it's... It, it lists maintain pedigree records, and that's the really important piece. And what you see, that's not needlework on the right side of the, of, the, uh, <laughs> of the slide. That's actually a snapshot of a computer generated pedigree of Oceanic Institute. And essentially, um, on, the, on the X or horizontal axis going from the top are the original founder stocks. And as you move down on the Y axis, that's generations. And the red or female, and the, and the blue is male. So this is really a snapshot of OI's pedigree database. And what we can do is, because of tagging and microsatellite markers, DNA fingerprints, I can go to OI right now, pick up a shrimp from our breeding program, and tell you, based on its tags and the computer database, I can trace it back to its parents, grandparents, 
great grandparents all the way back to 1995. Where it came the from? Blood the blood it's the it's the it's the genetic record, the ancestry of every shrimp at OI. And that information is valuable for two reasons. One, we can quantify inbreeding and we can manage against it. Remember I was saying earlier, breeding is this t pull and tug against selection and inbreeding. So yeah. we can manage inbreeding to make sure it doesn't cause problems. And we can also use it to assign breeding values to each family through a statistical uh, analysis. And so we can say this family has this type of breeding value, this family has this type, and we use those, in, th those, those data to make breeding decisions. So it's really exciting, yeah, actually, yeah. using the latest technology. Yeah, exactly. Ah, this is like Ancestry.com, but for <laughs> shrimp. <laughs> exactly. 23 and me for the shrimp. I think, actually, it's, this would be 88 and 87 and me. I think they have 88 chromosomes. But that's, yeah, so so the project in India is to help the Indian government um, um, develop a national breeding program. And co coincidentally or not, over the last year or two, India has become the largest exporter of farm shrimp to the United States. U.S. consumers buy more shrimp, farm shrimp from India than any other country in the world. How does that work? So, so you have a box of, uh, of shrimp broodstock. They're alive. They're in water, I guess. Right. You airship them somewhere to India, say, for example. Right. And there's a farmer out there in India who is going to take that and make that uh, broodstock work in a, in a, in a large uh, exactly. shrimp farm. So we'll send a, we'll send a certain number of, uh, we could send broodstock or small shrimp that they grow to broodstock. They take the broodstock and they put them in what's called a hatchery, a shrimp hatchery. And that's where they play the Barry Manilow music and soft no. candlelight and no. they reproduce. Well. Not very man. Maybe uh, some other. What about genre. Little Richard? Little Wouldn't Richard, that, yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> some kind of romantic music and setting. They they pipe romantic. it in. <laughs> Barry Manilow won't work. That's right. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> there, <laughs> maybe there's some Indian artists they play. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but but what these 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 broodstock will do is they'll mate and they'll produce one one female can produce over 150 200 thousand fertilized eggs per spawn or even higher. Yeah. And so uh, that magic will occur. They'll take the animals through a larval rearing stage, which is about 20, 21 days, where they, they go through this incredible metamorphosis, the baby shrimp, uh, incredible transformations. And then... Uh, what happens? They'll, they'll change their complete anatomy and their physiology changes. I mean, it's really quite a remarkable cellular program where a shrimp larvae in one day will look like barely more than a sphere, and then a few days later it's got this complex bilateral morphology, and, and it'll go from a strict uh, herbivore to a strict carnivore over the course wow, of a few days. Wow. I mean, just it's, it's Mother Nature at her finest, just re-engineering. Shrimp is a very old species, isn't it? It goes way back. It is. It, it is. To the 1800s, I suspect. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, no, they're, 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 that's an ancient lineage, that's for sure, on geological time scales, yeah, very yeah, old. Yeah. But, but so these shrimp hatcheries will then produce literally billions of baby shrimp that then get purchased by shrimp farmers who then truck them to their farms in some of the most remote corners of the earth and stock their ponds. And after maybe 90 or 100 days, they'll harvest the pond and they'll process the shrimp and ship it, so ship it back to the U.S. It's a cycle for them. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, it, takes, it takes a while for the shrimp broodstock to develop the ovaries and the spermatophores, and then uh, once you get them to spawn, that's about uh, uh, about a 20-day period. Then there's um, oftentimes maybe a four or five-week nursery period. Uh, so it varies on country and latitude and and uh, setup, um, the, the, um, but it, it it's it's a process. For a shrimp farm, you have to have water, though. You have to put the water. shrimp in water. You need water. And natural waterways. Is gonna well, be it's fresh. interesting is you it, ask. Is it fresh or is it seawater? The, the species we work with is a marine uh, species, but it's it's there's a term called urihaline. It can survive and actually grow quite well in a wide range of salinities. Uh, from full strength seawater, which is about 34 parts per thousand salt, all the way down to actually fresh water. You can grow this species in hard fresh water where there's a lot of dissolved minerals, but they do best between maybe 18 parts per thousand and full strength seawater. We've developed a technology, and I'll segue into our China project, where we've developed this technology where the shrimp 
can be grown in, it's an indoor shrimp factory where we recycle oh. and reuse the water. Oh, can you hold her a second? We're yeah. going to take a short break. You bet. I want everybody to be on tenterhooks <laughs> waiting about the indoor <laughs> shrimp factory <laughs> at Sean Moss of Oceanic Institute. And we are, after this short break, we're going to find out about indoor shrimp factories in China. Sounds good. So innovative. Whoa. <laughs> Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha, and bye-bye. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. You can see our show every Wednesday at noon at 12 p.m. on thinktechhawaii.com, as well as visiting YouTube and finding the link for the show there. The show is also aired on OC16. We look forward to seeing you on the show. Uh, we have many wonderful guests, uh, including Joan Husted, Corey Rosenley, where we talk about the very important issues of education for our keiki. We look forward to seeing you there. Sport Mom. industry, why not? Yeah. Um, our challenge, of course, is the shipping costs. Just like it costs a lot to bring in, it costs a lot to send out. But the Hawaii brood, shrimp broodstock industry is dealing with that. Yeah. Uh, and they're still making money hand yeah. over fist doing that. Okay, here's our slide. This is on uh, broodstock. What is this telling us, Sean? So, so SPF on top stands for specific pathogen free. That basically means the shrimp broodstock are free of specific pathogens that are causing all kinds of havoc across the globe uh, with shrimp diseases. The shrimp we grow here, because of our geographical isolation, the shrimp are disease free and we're able to not only maintain this disease free status, but certify it, which gives Hawaii a unique niche market. Um, when you say unique, you mean unique. I mean unique. The only place uh, that does it there, is here. Well, there are other places that claim to be SPF, and they can maintain it for a while, but they have far more challenges in, in maintaining this SPF status than we do, and that's because of our geographical isolation. It's the same with the, the honeybee industry, I think, and the corn seed industry. Mm -hmm. We're so geographically isolated here that it creates this very protective barrier and, and you're, we're able to maintain this SPF status. Mm -hmm. But what this, this shot, uh, slide shows is that, um, and this is from the state, uh, state Ag Department, um, these are broodstock sales by number um, from 2010 to 2015. The total at the bottom doesn't equal the total uh, in the white uh, because there are a number of countries I didn't list here. But you can see at $50 a piece per shrimp, and that's about the, the retail sale price. We sold in 2015 almost 800,000 broodstock worth almost 40 million dollars. This is export revenue and this was, as I understand, the number one consumable export out of Hawaii in 2015 was broodstock shrimp. Not coffee, not mac nuts, ah. not, it was broodstock shrimp. It, oddly enough, or interestingly enough, prior to I think this year uh, bottled water was the number one consumable export. <laughs> out, of, uh, out of Nelha. Out of Nelha, that's, that's right. right. But uh, in 2015, it's broodstock shrimp. So now what's interesting about this chart is when you and I last spoke, 2013, okay, you had something over 400,000 broodstock. Now it's doubled. It's doubled. And the number one country we're exporting to is China. And it's been like that uh, for a number of years now. You can see that on the bullet points below. Um, just an incredible, uh, incredible resource here. And Hawaii in the, in the shrimp farming universe, as small as that is, although it's about a $25 billion a year industry, Hawaii is the epicenter for high quality broodstock. It's when, when people think of genetically um, superior animals and disease free animals, they think of Hawaii. I recall when we spoke last, the price was about the same, maybe between forty and fifty dollars yeah. for a broodstock. Right. Um, are you going soft on that? Should you charge more? Can you charge? Will you charge more? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, 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 I'm not exactly sure what's setting that price. I think right now with cheap shipping costs, because oil is so cheap, uh, that price will probably remain where it is. I suspect if we get back up to a hundred dollars a barrel or more, uh, there may be a price pressure jump. down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or pressure up pressure up yeah, yeah interesting yeah. interesting so we'll see but uh, yeah it's a it's a fascinating story and 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 that the Hawaii broodstock industry had its origins 
in Waimanalo, in at OI. That's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I I love that about Oceanic. I love that about you know the the future of Hawaii. Uh, like it or not, is is going to be in aquaculture, largely, and we've got to go there. We've got to go there. Not only in Oceanic, not only with broodstock, but with everything sure. in aquaculture. I I agree. I agree. So let's talk about the Chinese. You thought I forgot already. Yeah, that's right, I did. <laughs> what about their innovative indoor broodstock, or rather shrimp farms? Right. So, so as I mentioned, one of the big problems in, in the global shrimp farming industry in traditional outdoor open ponds is disease. The industry loses billions of dollars in revenue from shrimp viruses and shrimp bacteria. How does the contamination get into the pond? It, through through influent and water, through infected shrimp that are stocked out of the hatchery. There's a number of uh, significant vectors, even birds carrying dead shrimp from one pond and flying to another and, and pooping in the pond uh, 50 kilometers away um, could transmit the disease. There's a number of different vectors for the disease. So, so most of the global shrimp farming industry that, uh, is centered on maybe five or six countries if, um, that really generate most of the shrimp. All of them are plagued with these diseases. So we started... This is why it's so important to have fresh SPF broodstock. Exactly. Because otherwise the diseases take over. Here you have a, a clean shrimp. Exactly you generate right. a whole generation of clean shrimp. And, that, and that's why a lot of the hatcheries in Asia ask for broodstock from Hawaii. They know at, at a minimum that the, the baby shrimp they're stocking in their ponds are not diseased. They may get diseases from these other vectors, but they know that the, the shrimp coming out of the hatchery are clean from disease. So what we've done is we've taken this SPF shrimp concept and tied it to an indoor shrimp factory, if you will, that buffers the shrimp from the outside world and also buffers the outside world from the shrimp production unit. So there's no if effluent being discharged into surrounding bays and estuaries, um, but the shrimp are protected from the disease outside. So we have a partner in China, we're working collaborative in a collaborative effort to, to scale up commercially the technologies that we've developed at OI, and they're having tremendous success. They're able to grow shrimp uh, at times when all of their neighbors who have the traditional open exposed ponds cannot. And so it gives them that competitive edge. The, op the startup costs are more and some of the operating costs are higher, but they're able to produce a, in a predictable supply year round. And what, what gets us excited too, Jay, is this technology, right now this farm is along the coast because we wanted to be in close proximity to the ocean. Um, but at some point when we refine the technology that you can grow these shrimp Anywhere. anywhere. You're not tied to latitude, you're not tied to the coast. You could put it in Beijing, you could put it in Detroit, you could put it in anywhere. And well, I'll talk about that. Yeah. So what does it look like? What does this innovative um, you know, facility look like? Is it like a tent over, over the water? Right, so the, the cover, the cover is, it could be a simple greenhouse structure. We, the way we d design this technology, light is bit very important because the algae add value. The algae help uh, take out toxins from the water. They help remediate the water. So you want the algae, and therefore and, you and want the, the bacteria, light. right? Okay. So it's so what we and we we've researched this for really uh, in earnest since 1998. So this is not a We've been really going at this from a research science perspective for a long time now. And we started off with a very hyper-engineered system. We were cleaning the water. We had all of these bells and whistles on. And we were able to grow the shrimp. But when we calculated cost per kilo or cost per pound, no one could afford it. And it was because of all of the electricity that, that was pumping water through filters and, and all of that. And so we slowly started to peel off all of these external loops and we found that the simplest design with the least amount of engineering um, resulted in the best shrimp environment. Now there's a bit of an and, art and the to best it. Cost factor. The best cost factor. You've got to be able to manage the feed and the microbial community. So that's um, there's a there's a, still a bit of an art to it, and that's why we're, we haven't seen this technology take off in a lot of places because of this artistic element. Um, we, our ultimate goal is to get this down to a prescribed, menu-driven, standard operating procedure, and, and I think we'll get there. But um, but we're really excited that we've taken this research concept and scaled it up now uh, to a commercial 
to a commercial scale in, in China. And I expect, I'm just guessing, but I expect that the facility with this cover on it, this high-tech facility, takes less square footage oh, than, than yeah. the conventional. Level. Oh, my goodness. I, I, it's, it's, the scale is something like 1 to 25. I mean, for every one, one unit of our shrimp production facility, you need 25 traditional units or something. The footprint is so small because we can stock the shrimp at such high densities that, that it really doesn't have much of a footprint at all. In fact, at OI a few years ago, we produced over 22 pounds of sh shrimp per square meter, three foot by three foot How, square. Over what period? That was probably 100 days in grow oh, the, the regular cycle. Right. But 22 pounds in a three foot by three foot surface area of market-sized, high-quality shrimp. That kind of intensive production really enables you to reduce the footprint of the farm. And so that's another real benefit to this. With, no, with this, really no discharge, no effluent discharge. Yeah, what I get out of this is that where a few years ago Oceanic was focusing on the broodstock itself, the SPF broodstock, now right. you, you've gone into other areas of technology right. and you've, you're designing aquaculture facilities yeah, yeah. to be used elsewhere. Exactly. And I should point out that the, the, we've selectively bred lines of shrimp that do well in these particular systems. So it's systems. hand in glove. Exactly. One, one synergizes with the exactly. other. Exactly, exactly. So the, the, the next logical question, and you alluded to it a minute ago, is so where can this happen? We know it can happen in China. It's happening in China. And I suppose it can happen in India, maybe Thailand. I'd love to see it happen here in Hawaii. That's the question. There we go. We do have some shrimp growers here in Hawaii, as any of us who've driven up to the North Shore. They grow some shrimp on Kauai. They do a nice job on Kauai. But um, we would like to see a, a prototype of this indoor, uh, low footprint shrimp farm here in Hawaii. It would be wonderful to see that. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So what about uh, Cleveland? What about Cincinnati? Okay. What about St. Louis? <laughs> you, can you grow this in relatively cold climate? You can. You have to keep the water relatively warm, uh, about uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. A little warmer would be good. Um, so there, there may, But there's a lot of uh, effluent heat being discharged out of power plants and other, you know, geothermal. And there's, there's cheap ways to use to get cheap heat. Um, but the, that, that when the when the water temperature drops much below, say, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the shrimp's growth rates slow down, and so the production economics don't start to look very favorable. Um, but but heating water is not, a, or or the air above the water is not not that big a deal. So we could do this. We could be growing shrimp in the middle of winter in Chicago. So this means really that the the shrimp, the production of shrimp, with this technology, can change around the world that you can have locally grown shrimp uh, with these facilities at a reasonable cost right. and no minimal shipping cost because it's happening right, right there. Uh, absolutely. All courtesy Oceanic Well, I, there's a, a lot of contributors to the intellectual property here. But I, I, I would also add not just shrimp, but uh, a whole suite of fish species, um, uh, abalone. Uh, we've, we've done some work with Big Island abalone on the Big Island with, with diets. That's the other critical piece. You need formulated, pelleted diets to uh, to do this anywhere. But uh, absolutely, I think uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's critically important that that the United States that we find the political will to invest in R and D. That's critically important, and to get the private sector to say, look, local food security is really important. Local food sustainability is really important, and we're going to invest in it. Um, Nationally, we import most of the seafood we eat as well. So there's a re real food security issue here. U.S. Department of Agriculture recently came out with new, um, new recommendations for seafood consumption, and it's higher than before. So we have one arm of the government saying, you've got to eat more seafood, but we don't have support from other parts of the government saying, we're going to provide the capital for R&D, and we don't have the private sector coming in and really investing in aquaculture yet. We're still relegated to importing a lot of the food, even though the U new USDA recommendations are eat more seafood. So um, so there's camera three, a uh, famous camera, th camera three, uh, two. <laughs> a famous camera two. And there's a, under the picture there of a lot of kids in a bar drinking. And uh, that's, that's we, we, we treat that as the public, okay? So if you were going to talk to them and tell them what Hawaii must do, what it needs to do, what's missing, 
between us and a robust aquaculture industry using this kind of technology, what would you say to them? Well, this is a, this is a pressure right now. I'm feeling the heat. I think, I think at the end of the day, like a lot of things, these are, these are complex problems with complex solutions. And I think there needs to be public-private partnerships. We need political will to lessen the, the, the regulatory burdens on growing food locally. Uh, we need help in terms of uh, research and developments. Um, but we also need the private sector to say, look, this is important. We're going to invest. We need the public um, com coming out and saying, we want to buy local fresh. Um, so it's really a, it's, it's a variety of, of stakeholders conspiring to say, this is really important to us, and we need to invest, and we need to create the political will. We need to create the pathway to make this happen. Um, but uh, as, a, as a researcher by passion, um, we also need to invest in the R&D because at the end of the day, food production will pivot from artistic farming to technology-driven food production. And so we need to invest in, in the R&D to make that, that pivot. The words that come to mind, and I'll address my comment to the same group, is do that. You'll be glad you did. <laughs> and I'm glad I did, and I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Jake. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure. Sean Moss, Oceanic Institute. Aloha. Thank you.